Good afternoon, everyone. Today we have a real treat. Julie Lithcott Hames has come up from Palo Alto. She's going to talk to us about a book she's written that has been on the New York Times bestseller list for quite a while now, How to Raise an Adult. I read through the book, it's really amazing, just in terms of the, the anecdotes, the advice, the research, a lot of things that I had seen in parenting for a long time, and it's, it's great to actually see it in print and think about it. I wish I had read the book 20 years ago. I want to share an anecdote with you just related to helicopter parenting. The, I, I have two boys. One, uh, Brandon, is a senior here. He's a Russian major. He's working on his thesis now. I have a younger son who's just starting college. And I coached youth sports for years. So one day I took my son and some of his friends. We went to a pond. And the idea was they were going to play hockey with their friends, except they didn't know how to pick teams. They didn't know how to actually play a game without parents showing them what to do. So taking that cue, I started just dropping he and his friends off, and they started playing football and baseball and basketball, and they actually lived like kids back in the 60s or 70s and did their own thing. Again, a lesson I probably learned too late, but it's, uh, it's really you know, amazing just being here today, having two, uh, two children in college, thinking about uh, the impact and, you know, again, wishing I had read this book. My name is Steve Merrill. I'm the chair of the Parents Council. I just wanted to thank everyone for coming this weekend, for participating in events. And uh, Julie's going to uh, talk about her book. She's also written a new book. She's about to take a book tour. She's going to be going to Powell's. And the book is called Real Americans. It's a memoir. It's going to talk about, or it does talk about, her experience with American racism and her journey towards self-acceptance. And I really am looking forward to reading that. She has a son in the class of 2021, Sawyer. Uh, so uh, she's doing double duty this weekend, uh, taking the opportunity to visit Sawyer. Without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Julie up to the podium and uh, look forward to hearing from her. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Let's thank Steve for his leadership as the chair of the Parents Council. You guys, we are where Hume gets taught. Whoa. And I'm about to talk to you about something far more controversial than that, which is parenting. Ha ha. Right? We take parenting so seriously these days. That's uh, why I wrote a book on the harm of overparenting. Um, I am thrilled to be here. As Steve said, um, I'm the parent of Aridi. Sawyer uh, is a freshman, and we are just overjoyed. My husband Dan is here, and Dan and I are overjoyed to um, be a part of this community. We look forward to getting to know you guys over the years, and we're excited to be here for Parents Weekend, Parent Family Weekend, and, and know you are as well. Um, this is really a full circle moment for me because I've written this book on um, the harm of overparenting, um, which emanates from my role as Dean of Freshmen at Stanford University, where I worked with other people's kids. And I was like, what are you people doing? You know, like I would show up at Parent Family Weekend and just try not to you know, wag my fingers too much. You know, but like, go away, like come for the weekend, yes, but then go home, you know, stop. And stop the overparenting. And then um, I realized I was overparenting my own two kids. And, um, and, and now we are at this magical moment of our eldest being in college, you know, which is the destination and all of that. So I'm going to share with you uh, what I observed as a dean of freshmen. And then I'm going to share with you some of my personal stories um, about my growth and my journey um, around these matters. And I'm just going to hope to end on time. Normally, I speak for an hour. And I don't want to make us late for the parent reception that's next. So I'm going to just try to just try to zip through. Um, I guess the first thing that I want to say, just to set the, the right tone here, is I don't think Reed asked me to speak because they think any of you are overparenting. Okay? <laughs> what we're here to do, 
What we're here to do is to talk about what other parents are doing wrong. <laughs> Okay, and then we're gonna go out into our communities, wherever y'all are from, and you know, sprinkle the knowledge, tell other parents how to stop overparenting. Okay, so overparenting, what is it? It is, it can be one of three things. Overprotection, which is um, the world is scary and unsafe and unpredictable, yes, and therefore I must prevent my kid from experiencing any of it and pr protect them from all of it instead of preparing my kid to be strong out there, overprotective. The second type is over-directive. I know best, kid, what leads to success, and you will do as I say. And maybe my love for you is conditioned upon your doing as I say and doing it very well. And the third type is the concierge. <laughs> How can I make your childhood more pleasant, honey? You know, just <laughs> handling every little thing. And any human is capable of all three types or two types or just one type. So none of you, I'm sure, but I know you know people who are behaving this way. So there are three things I know about us as parents, okay? I've got Sawyer, he's here, he's 18. And Ava, I'm so excited because I just got to see his face. He came out of Mac, you know, Mac 3. Anyone else got freshman in Mac 3? Nobody, okay, a few people, woo, I, woo. And he had this smile on his face. I was like, my son is here, so amazing. Okay, I'm gonna try to refrain from bursting into these bouts of joy over my son being a read. Three things I know about us as parents, but this is thing number one, we love them. God, do we love them. They're our kids. They're our precious sons and daughters. And we don't even understand the love. It's so fierce, it hurts, it's so good, right? So we love our kids. Number two, we are afraid for them, some of us. You know, worry, what is it gonna be like for them? Are they gonna be all right out in the world? You know, what will the world do to them? We have all these, we have this love, we have this fear. And the third thing we have, particularly in this era of parenting, which is no longer child rearing, we're parenting, we put ourselves at the center of it. The third thing I know to be true is our egos are really involved, right? We want that bumper sticker for the back of our car with the right college on it to impress all the drivers behind us with how amazing we are. I mean, our kids are. Right? So it's, right? So, so it's we're on the travel soccer team. You know, no, you're not. You just try running up and down the field. No, but we, you know, we can't get together with the grown-ups for a cocktail hour tomorrow because we have a midterm in high school. No, you're not in high school. You're not in college. Your kid is, right? So our egos are all wrapped up. So love, fear, and ego is kind of what's motivating us these days. And um, three more things I know. We want, of course, the very best for our kids. We will do all we can to ensure that they achieve. You know, we'll bring our influence, the networks, the knowledge we have. We will bring all of that to bear on channeling our kid toward the great future we have in mind for them, which means we do things like uh, wake them up, plan their day, remind them of things, bring them the things they've forgotten, argue with authority figures like teachers and coaches, rescue them, um, really try to perfect their life path. And then the third thing here is that we may succeed at all of this. That is, all of the stuff we do when we overparent, it has a short-term win. You know, we may succeed in getting the kid the opportunity we want for them when we overhelp. We might get them into the college we have in mind. We might get them to the career we've always wanted that kid to do. You know, our overhelp has short-term benefits. But here's what I know, having been a college dean on another campus, when we overhelp, when we overprotect, overdirect, and or hold their hands too long, they emerge chronologically adult, but they cannot hashtag adult, okay? They cannot. They do not have the life skills. They do not know how to be. They do not have agency in their own life. And as research shows, they are more likely to suffer from higher rates of anxiety and depression. Here's how I know all of this. I'm a parent, and I was a dean of freshmen, and my job as dean of freshmen was to give a damn about my freshmen. Okay, if you go into student affairs work, your job is to care about these young people unfolding into their adult selves, which is a process that is ugly before it is beautiful, right? 
Just remember back to your own self at 18, right? We all do it. I'm originally a corporate lawyer, then I'm a university dean, and my job is to give a darn about these young men and women on my campus. I was dean of freshmen for 10 years. I had, it's a much bigger school, Stanford, 1,700 in the freshman class, 17,000 over 10 years. And I knew a lot of my students because my job was to care about them. And my job was to care about them, so not what do their parents want them to be, what does their entire extended family want them to be, what does their entire ethnic community want them to be, just them. Who are you? What do you know to be true about yourself so far, kid? What are you good at? What do you love? What do you value? How are you going to make the most of these four precious years? And in my years as dean, I grew increasingly concerned that my students, though very impressive on paper, were not very connected to all the stuff they had done. And I found myself worrying increasingly over those 10 years, have you ever made a choice? Have they let you make a choice, kid? Or are you just really great as do, at doing as you are told? To me, too many students over the years seemed existentially impotent, unfamiliar with their own self, lacking agency in their own life. And it worried me. I was worried about them as individuals. I was worried about us as a society. Like, what's to become of us if the largest generation in American history the millennials can't hashtag adult. You know, we're going to need them to take care of us one day. You know, they've got to have the life skills. It's not about the thick childhood resume. It's can you get yourself up? You know, keep track of your stuff. Can you make a plan? You know, can you solve a problem? Can you cope? And cope doesn't mean text your parents and have them cope for you. So I became fascinated with what was going on and how we got here and what had happened. And I came to appreciate, because I'm raising my kids, Dan and I are raising our kids in Palo Alto, California, the heart of Silicon Valley, in the shadow of Stanford's Hoover Tower. And I know from my community, and by the way, let me pause here and say this was not just a Stanford thing. My concerns uh, as a dean were not limited to the, st my concerns were about Stanford, but I would go to conferences and meet with people at colleges and universities, from colleges and universities all over the US, large, medium, small, public, private, east, west, north, south, midwest, we were all seeing this, you know, this sort of diminishment of agency in our students and what comes with it, the encroachment of parents into the lives of college students and onto the university shores. So I came to appreciate that one of the things we're doing when we're hell-bent on our kids getting to the right future because of our you know, fears and our egos, you know, fueled by that love, we're creating what I call the checklisted childhood. In many communities, this is what we're doing. We want to be in the right community. We've got to get our kids in the right school. Whether it's public or private, we know the school. We've got to get in that school. We want to be sure they're taking the right classes in the right school. We want to be sure their grades are great in the right classes at the right school. So nowadays, childhood can be full of tutoring and coaching to move, you know, not just for Fs and Ds, right, to move the B pluses to As, right, the sort of perfectionism. Have to get the right grades in the right classes to impress the right colleges. You know, and not just grades in the checklisted childhood, they got to get all the scores down. So evenings and weekends are given over to studying for the standardized tests and taking those tests and retaking those tests. And it's not just the grades and scores in the checklisted childhood, it's the accolades we hope they'll be given and the awards we hope they'll get because that's important and the sports they have to do because that matters too and the activities and the leadership. Don't forget the leadership. The colleges want to see the leadership. And don't forget community service. Check the box to show them you care about others, preferably very far away. <laughs> and all of this is supposed to be done perfectly. You know, we are holding our kids to a standard of perfection that is so much higher than any of us was held to, almost all of them. None of us were held to that level of perfection. And they're still kids. They still need sleep and play. But we put them in a cage of enrichment. It's a cage. Their lives are scheduled to the hilt. You know, all in furtherance of getting them to the grand future we have in mind. And because they have to be flawless, well, of course we have to overparent. You know, if we don't correct our kid's algebra and just let him turn it in as it is, he'll be competing with every other kid's parents. <laughs> parents 
parents are doing their kids' homework. None of you I know. But we all know somebody, right? It's become this arms race where you go to the science fair and you think, gosh, I got to go get a PhD in chemistry just to do my kid's science project. <laughs> you know, right? Or how did we get a B on that paper? We worked so hard on it. <laughs> we, all right. Oh, the laughter is good. It's very good to laugh at ourselves. All right, so we're bringing them the forgotten stuff, forgotten coat, lunch, sporting equipment, homework. We're arguing with the teacher about how they taught the class, why they taught the class that way. Might they teach the class differently because our kid needs it this way? What about the grade? Why did they grade it that way? Couldn't they give a regrade? Couldn't we just try to perfect every outcome, arguing with the coaches, arguing with the umpires, arguing with the referees, as if every single aspect of childhood is essential for the future we have in mind for them. So of course we have to overparent. As dean, I found myself thinking, when I talk to my students, I don't care how impressive your childhood resume is. Can you think for yourself? Do you know how to play freely with people your own age? Can you make a choice? Can you solve a problem, a routine problem? Can you cope with routine adversity? Can you dream? And I think that for me is the most poignant um, concern. I sat in a room about this size at Stanford listening to Bill Derisowitz, who had just written Excellent Sheep, The Miseducation of the American Elite. He was given a lecture. I'm sitting there taking notes for my book. And this Stanford student raises her hand and she asks him, what's shaping the way we dream? And I thought, my God, how innocent and beautiful. You know, like what's shaping the way we dream? I know the answer. Our expectations, our definition of success is shaping the way our kids dream. And I think it's tragic. Overparenting was happening at the college level at Stanford. Here's what overprotection, overdirection, and handholding looked like at Stanford. Just some examples. Um, the overprotective parent would email me or call me. Um, Julie, I'm um, very concerned about my daughter. I haven't heard from her in a day. And, um, <laughs> and I've called her nine times. <clears throat> and I would say, well, um, I'm thinking like, sir, you know, a, a day. But I said, um, we could do a welfare check in her dorm. Be happy to send someone over and, and check on her and make sure she's there. And he said, I know she's there. I can see the blue dot. <laughs> but she hasn't responded to my nine phone calls. And I'm thinking, gee, I wonder why not. <laughs> right? But this sense that our children are endangered rhinos in the Serengeti. You know, like, I have to know at all times where they are, my child you know, who's 18 or 20 or 22, could be in the military, but is at Stanford, which is far more treacherous, and I need to know, right? All right. So um, over-directive showed up like this. You better major in economics, kid. I'm only paying for college if you major in econ, or if you will be pre-med and go to med school. No parent ever says, you'd better major in art history. <laughs> you might, Diane, right? Don't come home for Thanksgiving unless you're a French literature major, right? <laughs> Nobody says that, right? It's the careers we want for our kids, right? Because we are in that career or we wish we were, right? So we want our kid to go into law, business, medicine, STEM, one of those things, right? So the overdirected parent um, is, and again, the kid feels that the parent's love is conditioned upon that stuff. And then the hand holder. The concierge parent at the college level you know, might email somebody like me, I need my son's password, I need to register him for class. <laughs> He's too busy, it's too complicated, or you know, I've always done it, so how can I stop? You know? <laughs> um, or my daughter is going abroad with you to Berlin next quarter. And when is your parent orientation session for study abroad? Now y'all, Who's baby boom or Gen X in the audience? Raise your hand. When we went abroad to another country when we were 20, often we were abroad before our parents knew we were gone. <laughs> Am I right? 
But now, no, 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 the parent expects an info session with a speaker and some slides so that we can be successful in Berlin. How about this? Um, parent A would email me CCing parent B, we are very unhappy with the grade the chemistry professor gave our child. There's so much wrong with that sentence. <laughs> gave, child, we, you know, we who run the place expect your son or daughter to go talk to their chemistry professor and or TAs, which you have at a large university, you know, about their progress in the class, their questions, their concerns, their interests, right? We don't expect you, the parent, have any role to play in this except to pay the bill, <laughs> right? You do not have a right, a place, you do not have a role in this relationship between the professor and your student. Right? But they wanted the professor's email so they could, what? I don't know, but part of me wanted to say, here it is, <laughs> you know, because the chemistry faculty were the least tolerant of anyone telling them anything. <laughs> so um, part of me wanted to just see what would happen. Um, and then, here's an example not from Stanford. Um, I was at the University of Miami giving this talk, and uh, the vice provost for student affairs there said, Julie, you're not going to believe this, but we just had a, so this is a concierge example from another campus. She said, we had parents install a webcam in the freshman dorm room. <gasps> right? <laughs> Awful. Like, what? What are you looking for? <laughs> For an improper, weird reason. I mean, it was, it was to wake the kid up. So when I'm talking to high school parents and they all gasp like you just did, I say, you guys, I know some of you have 12th graders and you're waking them up. How are you going to stop next fall? If you're waking up your high schooler, of course you're going to have to wake them up in college because you never taught them that they have to wake themselves up. All right. Kids end up feeling, particularly when they're managed around, like, you will be a this, you know, you will do that. They feel like dogs on leashes, like we're the trainer. It's like the Westminster dog show, and there we are with our outfits and our clucking, like, come on, kid. You know, and the kid is, our child is on a leash, and we put the hoops up, and they jump through the hoops, you know. Or they're like little greyhound dogs in a race called childhood, and they, you know, they're in the lane with their blinders on, and they have to stay at the lane, and they chase that dirty rabbit around the track of their childhood. And we, the parents, are up in the stands with our friends clinking our drinks. Look at my child. Look at him run. You know, isn't he great? And, and the kid, whether they finish childhood, meaning they reach 18, they graduate high school, they go to college, whether they finish first or second, you know, or 10th, or halfway through, or breathless straggling at the end of the pack. They are tired. This checklisted childhood wears kids out. And as Dean, I found myself saying, how is it humanly possible for to accumulate all of this in childhood? And over the years, I concluded it's not humanly possible. Some of them make it through unscathed. A lot of them are scathed. We can treat them like dogs. We might think of them like investments. So many parents these days say, return on investment. I need to know how they're doing, how they do. Were they in class today? This is K through 12. You know, I'm sure it doesn't happen at the college level, right? Were they in class? How did they do on the quiz? Have they turned in their homework? Are they, you know, I need to know because I need to know, are we up or are we down, right? Like a stock. You know, like we might sell that kid short, you know? Because <laughs> we're not getting the right return, ROI, you know, from our son or daughter. And then the metaphor that I like the best is the bonsai tree. Um, this, you know what a bonsai tree is, right? Lovely little miniature replica of a real tree growing in the wild. And when we approach parenting with the checklisted childhood, we end up treating our kids like bonsai trees. Um, a lovely replica of a human that we envision them to be. So we plant them in the pot, which is their, our town, our neighborhood, the right school. And we expose them to the right nutrients, you know, the opportunities, our values. And then we're the gardener. We're in charge of this child, this thing, this bonsai tree. We take our clipping shears, our pruning shears, and we clip them here so they'll grow more here. And we'll clip them here so they grow more here. So we're clipping and pruning our child so that ultimately they resemble this amazingly, you know, adorable version of a real human, you know, that we have made them into. Like, look at my child. 
Look what I've done, my masterpiece. All right. So I'm, here's an exception, an important exception. Who was not overparented? Who was not turning to their cell phone for every answer and solution? Poor kids, working class kids. When, and I knew the backgrounds of my students, so could figure it out, find out, I was struck by the self-reliance and the resilience of kids who were from the lower socioeconomic side of the line, from the lower socioeconomic um, class, all right? They were not accustomed to having a parent, you know, micromanage their life. They had this strong I. Dean Julie, they called me. Dean Julie, you know, I've done this or this has happened. I got to figure this out. I think I've got a few options. Can I run them by you? Yes. You know, let's talk it through. Okay, great. We've talked. I'm going to go try this and I'm going to check back in with you. I, 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 I. Never like, oh, I need to get my mom or dad to handle it. Their more affluent parents were texting a parent to say, oh no, what do I do? Please handle. I'm not trying to romanticize poverty or struggle, being poor, being working class. I am saying that when kids emerge from that environment, they have a tray in their toolkit, the more affluent kids lack. And it actually was a beautiful thing to see. It was actually a beautiful thing to see. All right. I'm going to share with you some of my stories now as quickly as I can here. All right. So like some people you may know, so that was my life as a dean. Now I'm a parent. Like some people you may know, I was always obsessed with my kids going to the right schools, K through 12. Anyone? <laughs> anyone know anyone? OK. So where we live, it's in Palo Alto. The right school starts with Bing Nursery School. OK, it's Stanford's nursery school. It's a laboratory for the psychology faculty. They study infant and childhood development through one way. They observe the kids through one-way mirrors and do experiments. OK, the marshmallow experiment that taught us about delayed gratification, that was done a thing. OK, I'm sure they're observing parents as well through those mirrors. <laughs> so I knew if Dan and I ever ended up having kids and we lived near Palo Alto, we would want our kids to get their rightful start in life at Bing so that they could ultimately get you know, to the college we had in mind for them which might have been the college where we met, which was the college where I was a dean, Stanford. All right, so um, I had a C-section with Sawyer. And I'd been in the hospital for five days. And we are finally going home. And Dan is holding Sawyer and walking to the car so carefully. And I'm just trying to hold my stapled C-section belt together, <laughs> walking to the car. We get into the car, and you know, Dan buckles Sawyer in the first time. He's got a real human in the car seat, not a doll or a teddy bear, but like, remember? Remember that like five point infant thing? And so we get Sawyer in the car seat and I'm in my strapping myself in and Dan drives, eases out onto the highway and he's going like 40 miles an hour, you know? And so it should take 25 minutes to get up to San Carlos, but it takes probably 40 minutes because we're going slow, infant on board. We get to our house and Dan gets out and he's coming around to get Sawyer and I say, um, actually, honey, could you just go into the house? There's that stack of papers on my desk. About two thirds of the way down is an application for Bing Nursery School. <laughs> I'd had it for 18 months, but they don't let you apply when your kid is just in your mind. You know, you have to have a name and a birth date. And we had that now. So I said, get the form. I'd filled it all out except for the name and the birth date. Sawyer George Lucahim, 61599. And honey, we need to get back in the car and drive back down to Palo Alto. <laughs> to turn in the form because you guys, he was already five days old. I didn't want to ruin his future. So Sawyer got to Bing. Thank you very much. And, um, and then we, we bought a house in the Palo Alto School District. Now, the Palo Alto Public Schools are said to be the best in the Bay Area, some of the best in California, some of the best in America. And so my mother sold her house in Massachusetts that was this big. And, and we sold our tiny little California starter home for the same amounts of money, put them together, and bought one damaged house in Palo Alto that no one else wanted for the public schools to get our kids to the right university. So, um, and I'm going to those back to school nights when Sawyer and his little sister Avery, you know, are in elementary school. I'm cramming my body into the little chairs at back to school night, you know, just. You know, what do we need to do to be successful in the fourth grade? You know, I just want to know, like, what is, you know, I clearly don't think my own kid can succeed at life without me kind of being there, living it for and with him. 
And you know, when play dates were difficult, I would get so worried and think like, oh, I gotta talk to the parent. You know, the kids aren't getting along and I was tying their shoe, Velcroing their shoes too long. <laughs> All right, so that's, that's what it kind of looked like in our house. And then I'm dean of freshmen at Stanford, and I'm at an orientation session for the parents of my 1,700 new students, and I'm giving this annual speech that I gave every year. Trust your kid. Trust your son or daughter. They have what it takes to thrive here. Trust us. We're not trying to get away with doing as little as possible here at Stanford. Trust your kid, trust us, now please leave. Remember I said I tried not to, right? But I, I wasn't wagging my fingers, but I was saying like, come on folks, it's not middle school, go home. I gave that speech year after year after year, and then finally after seven years, my own kids are 10 and eight, and I come home for dinner the next night, and we're having chicken, and I sit next to Sawyer, and I lean over, and I start cutting his meat. <laughs> I'm a little nervous about telling these stories here. <laughs> You're gonna be like, oh, that's Sawyer, okay. <laughs> he could not cut his own meat when he was 10. <laughs> and some of you were cutting your own kid's meat, I know it. And, and some of you are texting your younger kid right now, you better cut your meat tonight, honey. <laughs> and that was my aha moment, that you cannot magically let go of your 18-year-old at college if you're holding on too tightly to your 17-year-old, to your 16-year-old, to your 15-year-old, and so on, going back in time. I realized it was like the ghost of Christmas future had visited me and saying, you know, Dickens, right? It's like, if you ever want that boy to be independent, you must stop cutting his meat. And I was like, okay, but like, where's the book? You know, when do you stop cutting their meat? When do you let them cross the street? When do you make them tie their shoes? When do you let them talk to strangers? I don't talk to strangers. We teach them like it's a skill. That's not a skill. How to discern the one creepy stranger from the vast majority of humans is the skill, okay? But their childhood is an admonishment. Don't talk to strangers, and then their life is full of strangers when they leave our homes, and they're bewildered. <laughs> All right, I gotta fast forward now, let's see. I began to try, what did you say? No, no, no. Uh, okay, so I began to try to stop concierging the heck out of my kid's life. I'm definitely all three types. The concierge have a fiercely clear future in mind for my kids and a little bit worried about their safety at all times. All right, so, um, so I set out to try to stop doing that because I've got the, it's like working with other people's kids. I got to see the future. I got to see 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 and I got to apply it to the present in my own house. And I could see the students on my campus who had a sense of self, who could kind of make a choice, solve a problem, get back up when life knocked them down. And I thought, okay, I want my kids to be like those students, not these other ones who seem so, you know, veal-like in their, in their, <laughs> right? That's what they seem like. Young adults who can't hashtag adult, they're like adorable, they're like human veal. And you just have to worry, isn't the world gonna slaughter them? And yes, it might. And we don't want that for our children because we love them. All right. So um, when Sawyer was a sophomore, he had five hours of homework a night. That's a lot, right? Right? Okay, it was sophomore year, you guys. Now in the sophomore year, he was 15, Spanish three, honors chem, algebra two trig, fast lane to lead to the right calculus and the intergalactic math beyond that. Fancy history, fancy English, two other classes, I can't remember, but a very rigorous you know, program at a very rigorous public high school, all to get him to the right future. Five hours. Now Sawyer doesn't do any activities. Sawyer doesn't do sports, um, doesn't do activities, doesn't do, he reads. He reads books. He reads magazines, he reads Discover, he reads Science, he reads The Week, he reads current events, he reads novels and he reads for pleasure all the time. Every day, he wants to read at every meal. We don't let him, because we know the family dinner is important. We're supposed to talk about our day at the family dinner. <laughs> but you know, we let him read at breakfast. We let him read at breakfast. This is a kid who's always carried a book with him, always. When he was tiny and would go on play dates, he would take a book with him because, you know, just in case it didn't work out. <laughs> He'd have a book. Anyone got a kid like that? Read? All right. So. Sawyer 
Um, so Sawyer has got five hours of homework in the mail. And um, we're watching this happen. It's October of his sophomore year, and we're thinking, like, wow, this is a lot, you know? But this seems to be what the system requires. Um, he's working Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, five hours, you know, comes home, has a snack, um, reads uh, a little bit at snack, and then uh, homework, and more homework, and dinner, and then more homework. And he's going to bed at about 11.30, it feels like, in the grand scheme of things. And um, into the first weekend this goes, Saturday, he's doing homework Sunday, and Dan and I sit down with him and say, you know, honey, this looks like a lot of work. And he was doing well in all of these classes, but the stack of work was so much. And we, we tried to help him figure it out. We're sure it's a problem that can be solved. Try to teach him to chunk big assignments into smaller bits. Try to teach him some better time management skills. Help him think through how he can talk with his teachers about this workload and how to just kind of make it happen more effectively. Into week two this goes. And I'm starting to notice Sawyer's not bringing a book to breakfast. Um, through week two this goes, his eyes are starting to be red and he's losing that sort of spirit and joy that just sort of, I love school, I'm good at school. You know, he's losing that kind of spirit that has animated our child since he was tiny. Into the second weekend this goes, into the third week this goes, and my kid is now holding his head up at breakfast, you know, just sort of, just sort of there. So Dan and I um, are really worried because we're noticing that our kid is changing. But we think this is what's required. Well, he'd been leaving Spanish 3 for last. And he loves Spanish 7th grade, 8th grade, ninth grade. But now 10th grade, he seems to hate it. And he's saving it for last. And he's doing his homework at the desktop in the kitchen. It's 11.30, near the end of week 3. And I see Sawyer is, has left Spanish for last. His back is to me so I can see the desktop over his shoulder. And I can see he's, not, he's doing the Spanish, but he's not even doing it. Google Translate is doing it. Google Translate is, you know, he puts in the English, it's telling him the Spanish, and he's writing it down. My kid is officially doing school, going through the motions to get the work done. And I'm devastated. For him, for us, this is not what we have in mind. This isn't working. It's only first semester, sophomore year. He's got, we've got the rest of sophomore year, all of junior year, into senior year. None of this looks sustainable. Plus, he's not really behaving like himself anymore. My kid, I'm worried about my kid. So Dan and I start to talk, um, and we talk about whether we ought to let Sawyer, ask Sawyer if he needs to drop a class, because it just looks like it's too much. And in that moment, we had to contemplate the best colleges, quote unquote, might not want our son because he didn't take all the classes. You know, the future we had in mind for him might be shut to him if we let him drop a class. But our kid became more important than that. So we decided to ask him. We decided I'd do it. It was now midnight, and he was in bed with the door shut. I knocked on his door, and he said, come in. And he was already up in his bed. He was still then sleeping in the loft Dan built for him when he was a little boy in a Harry Potter-themed room with wands on the wall and cloaks and filled with books. And I climb the steps to the loft, and I look down at Sawyer, and I say, sweetheart, Dad and I are so impressed with how hard you're working, you know, but it just looks like there's so much work. There's no time for you to even read anymore. You're not even carrying a book around. Honey, you know, isn't it too much? Do you think you might need to drop a class? And Sawyer looked up at me and said, can I? Don't you guys expect me to do all of this? Don't I have to, Mom? Isn't it what'll make you proud? You know what I was thinking. We bought this house here so you could go to this school so you could take all of these classes and have the great future we have in mind, which entails your taking them all and doing very well at all of them. But I didn't say any of that. I looked down at my sweet child and I said, honey, in some theoretical universe, we wanted you to have access to all of this opportunity. But what matters more than any of that is you and you're struggling, you might even be suffering, do you think you might need to drop a class? And his eyes brightened a little bit, and he said, I'll think about it, Mom. Well, he came down for breakfast the next day with a book under his arm, which I took as a good sign, and he said, Mom, I think I might need to drop a class. 
and I think it might need to be Spanish. <laughs> Yes, I was thinking Spanish might be the problem, Sawyer. <laughs> but by then, I wasn't the concierge to handle it, figure it out. Can you drop? How do you drop? What are the ramifications? But I practiced with him how to have a respectful conversation with his guidance counselor and advocate for himself. So when his guidance counselor said, oh, Sawyer, you can't drop Spanish because colleges want to see it, Sawyer said, colleges want to see language proficiency. And I don't think I'm going to impress them with the D I'm likely to pull off. And if I drop Spanish, I'll have one more, you know, one fewer class of signing work and one more hour in the day in which to do my work and I can focus on the honors chemistry that I love and the algebra two trig and the fancy history and the fancy English and the two other <laughs> classes. This boy loves science and he wants to be a bench scientist. And you know why I'm crying because you know where this story goes. Sawyer dropped Spanish. We got Sawyer back. And in that moment, I went from talking the talk about there are plenty of great schools out there, folks. There's plenty of great schools. You do not have to perfect your kids every moment, micromanage their childhoods to get them into the US News Top 20, because there are better schools out there. And it's all about fit and belonging. And I had been saying that and writing that and telling other people that for a long time. And in that night, I finally began to walk the walk and believe that the right school for my kid was out there and would love him for who he was. I want to give you time for questions. I'll just jump to this. So Sawyer wants a PhD in genetics. So we went on the internet. We, when he was, <laughs> I know. He was with me, at least. And um, <laughs> and there's a list. Where do PhDs get their start? And there are schools on it, like Caltech. MIT, Kalamazoo, I'd never heard of it, Michigan, Oberlin and Ohio, Swarthmore in Pennsylvania, and say it with me, Reed. So Sawyer applied to 13 schools, didn't get into half of them, because he dropped Spanish. <laughs> or because of his other imperfections, like no sports, no activities, no leadership, no community. You know, like try to, he just reads and thinks. Try impressing a other colleges with that these days. <laughs> but when Reed College in Portland, Oregon admitted my son, they sent him a letter with confetti that spilled out into our kitchen. And they sent him a book. It was, as you know, the Iliad. And I had to remove myself from the kitchen because I tried not to cry in front of my kids. And I bawled in the front hallway because I knew what Reed was saying was Sawyer. George Lithcott Hames, we see you, we get you, we like you, come join us. And when we dropped him off here in August, he found his people within moments, and Dan and I were overjoyed that our son and Reed had found each other, and we knew he would feel a sense of belonging here. Who? I tell this story everywhere I go, but you know why I'm crying here, because we're here. <laughs> so well, you guys, what I'm trying to say is this. Because I was the dean working with other people's kids, dragged down the path of their life towards some future the parent had in mind, and because I realized I was doing that to my own, I learned the hard way that my kids are not bonsai trees, and neither are yours. They're wildflowers. They're wildflowers, sometimes a mystery to us. They're their own thing. They're not ours to clip and prune. What a joy it is to be alongside a young human becoming their own self. I've learned the hard way that we are not supposed to airlift our children to the summit we have in mind, even if it's the summit we summited, even if it's the summit we wished we had summited. You know, it is for them to chart their own path. And if we walk alongside them, taking an interest in who they are and helping them become their best selves, and they will arrive at the summit of their choice with some skills because they've done it themselves and with the mental health and wellness to thrive wherever they go. Thank you very much.